America's number one national television program on Asia. Hello, I'm Yusai Khan. Welcome to Looking East. Every country in the world is concerned with a system of self-defense. Tonight, we'll take you to the Great Wall of China, built in the third century BC to defend the Chinese civilization from the barbarian hordes, and is one of the wonders of the world. Then we'll have a rare look at a sophisticated modern defense system, and that of the tiny nation of Singapore, whose impressive air force, navy, and army should intimidate any aggressor. We'll be back in a moment. Today's most surprising fabric is over 4,000 years old. Silk from China. Soft, comfortable, clinging, sensuous silk. Tough, durable, long-lasting silk. Yet the biggest surprise is that this miracle fiber costs as little as it does. Silk, queen of fabrics. first came into being some 25 centuries ago. At the time, China was divided into several feudal states, engaged in constant struggle for territory and power. To protect themselves against each other and plundering northern tribes, walled fortresses were built. When the tyrannical emperor Chen Shi Wang Di united China in the 3rd century BC, he harnessed a massive labor force of several hundred thousand soldiers and peasants to link the individual sections into one great wall. Through the centuries, the wall has been reinforced and renovated, most notably during the Han Dynasty and also during the Ming Dynasty, which flourished from the mid-14th to mid-17th centuries. Like many other precious cultural artifacts, the Great Wall as we know it today is mainly a legacy of the Ming Dynasty. Through the ages, it has stood not only as a physical barrier, but a psychological one as well. It reinforced the ethnocentric view the Chinese had of the world. The wall was designed as a cultural barrier that kept barbarians out and true civilization in. This is where they used to stand guard against barbarians from this side, and the other side was supposedly civilization. 
and the reach of civilization as the Chinese knew it was defined by this magnificent piece of architecture, blazing a serpentine trail from east to west across 4,000 miles of wildly contrasting terrain. And if 4,000 miles seems just like a lot of numbers, just imagine any single piece of construction that runs from New York to Los Angeles and then back to Chicago. At its easternmost extreme, the wall literally rises from the sea like a great stone dragon. So quite appropriately, this place is known as Old Dragon Head. However, most people consider the real starting point of the wall to be Shanghai Guan, a town bordered by mountains on the northeast and the Bohai Sea on the east. Its square fortress has four gates, one at each point of the compass. The eastern gate tower bears the inscription, the first gate under heaven. Again, a reminder that here at the wall lies the gateway of true civilization. Perhaps the most frequented pass during the vast expanse of the Great Wall is Zhuyongguan, probably because of its proximity to Beijing, which is less than 40 miles away. Originally built during the Qin Dynasty, Zhuyongguan derived its strategic importance as the north-south communications link. West of the gates is the Cloud Terrace, a marble structure which was originally the base of a watchtower. The first Ming Emperor attached so much importance to this section of the wall that in addition to its heavy fortification and renovation, he built the nearby Badaling section as well. Badaling is the crown of the Great Wall. The walls here are 25 feet high and 20 feet wide, enough for five horses or ten people to pass side by side. Here, this intimidating ribbon of watchtowers, battlements and parapets rise and fall, disappearing behind one peak only to reappear on another further on, running at angles that seem to be architecturally impossible. And yet here it is, peak after perilous peak, seeming to go on forever in its grandeur. It is with good reason that this part of the Great Wall is reputed to be the most invulnerable to attack. If anything, from the vantage point of the wall, it would seem that the attackers are the vulnerable ones. After crossing five provinces, two autonomous regions, not to mention some of the most breathtaking scenery China has to offer, the wall which rose from the sea in the east sinks into a sea of sand in the west. Here in the Gobi Desert, the wall is built of earth, probably because it was the material most available. This western terminus of the wall is called Jia Yuguan. This magnificent brick fortress, with its lofty walls and watchtowers, protected the Silk Road from marauding bandits and also from the shifting sands. And it is also through these gates that criminals and disgraced officials were banished to the wilderness of Central Asia. So it was once perceived as a kind of gate to hell. What you may not know about the Great Wall is that along its entire length, every half mile, is a signal tower like this one. At night, they will make a fire. In the daytime, they will make smoke to warn of the approach of enemies. Yet, despite the ingenuity of the architects and strategists who designed and built the wall, it did not always succeed as a defensive barrier. Genghis Khan's Mongols broke through in the 13th century, and the Manchus did it again in the 17th century. Soon, China's image of itself as a culturally superior civilization was severely challenged by countries which had advanced into the industrial age and which would penetrate China's defenses with such new weapons as trade and diplomacy. So like the country is symbolized, the wall also came to show the strain of years of battle, erosion, neglect and vandalism. 
especially during the Cultural Revolution, when people actually used bricks from the wall for their own homes and roads. And so, nearly half a millennium after the efforts of the Ming emperors, China has set about the task of rebuilding the Great Wall. When you hear the sounds of style, the words Regent International Hotels can never be far behind. Fly the traditional way to the Orient on Northwest with more experience across the Pacific than any airline in the world, daily non-stops to Tokyo, and convenient service to nine other Pacific cities. All our Trans-Pacific flights are comfortable 747s, and you'll enjoy regal imperial service with an excellent choice of entrees in first and executive class. For a gracious tradition across the Pacific, go Northwest. Only Malaysia offers you the essence of the East. The color and drama of festivals that reflect our truly multicultural society. of enchanting people and of luxury. So come and experience the fascination. In July of 1984, a fundraising campaign called Love the Motherland and Repair the Great Wall was launched. What has happened is a far cry from the days of Chen Shi Wang Di, when thousands and thousands of people were conscripted into forced labor to build the wall. Today, the wall is being restored by the voluntary contributions of admirers of the wall from all over the world. In a way, this restoration campaign has broken down the cultural barrier that the wall itself represented. How else could you explain donations from the French, the Swedish, the Japanese, or from Chinese families who have made their homes in Europe, America, and Asia? People from all walks of life have contributed. Artists, factory workers, retired folk giving their life savings, and a seven-year-old girl who gave up her pocket money. And perhaps the most touching donation came from a blind person who wrote, although I cannot see it, the Great Wall has always been etched upon my heart. In the first 20 days after the fundraising campaign started, an astonishing 700,000 yuan was raised. Reconstruction began at once and has proceeded at a brisk pace, certainly under far more humane and scientifically advanced condition than the Qin Dynasty. One of the sections of the wall, which has recently undergone restoration for public viewing, is in the Mutianyu Valley, located some 40 miles northeast of Beijing. Well, what was once constructed to ward off invaders has now been reconstructed to welcome invaders.
Today, however, the only invaders come armed with cameras and tour maps instead of spears and muskets. They are here not for conquest, but perhaps to absorb the palpable sense of history that still seems to linger about the Great Wall. Here they may also ponder the changes and contradictions that have come to pass. <laughs> that while hundreds of thousands perish under the extremely inhumane conditions of its building, the wall has come to represent the pinnacle of human achievement. And what once stood as a divider, separating one country from the rest of the world, is now a place that brings together people from all over the world. They come to gaze and marvel at the stunning possibilities of human endeavor. There's an old Chinese saying, you are not a hero unless you have been to the Great Wall. And here we are, all heroes at the Great Wall. There is an island on this earth so colorful, it is surely the work of a master painter. An island where even on a grey day, a yellow hue shines through. Where a stroke of green becomes a jade figurine. And birds sing their tune. Where exotic orchids bloom. And men walk near to the moon. Island where fish of blue delight the eye, then continue their journey across the sky. Where with every drop of gold, a romantic evening will unfold. An island where the red streak renders the image complete. Singapore, the most surprising tropical island on Earth. Make this the year you visit China. Come explore the wonders of China's glorious past. Experience its dynamic present. Discover the mysteries of 4,000 years of culture. Thrill to the breathtaking scenery found nowhere else in the world. Come, come to China, the ultimate adventure. For free brochures, contact China International Travel Service, 60 East 42nd Street, New York, New York, 10165. Only one company has the capability to deliver more travel and hospitality services to China. Inter-Pacific Tours International. Inter-Pacific offers the widest choice of vacation travel, business travel, performing arts groups, trade missions. In fact, every travel need to China. Only one, Inter-Pacific, delivers like no other travel company in the world. Call your travel agent and insist on Inter-Pacific Tours. There is one message Singapore wants its neighbors to understand without a shadow of doubt. It is that this little country is prepared to defend itself, if necessary, to the last Singaporean. It is ready to strike fast at any attacker. It keeps a big air force for a little nation, over 100 planes. In addition to these trainers, they have F-5 Tiger Interceptors and A-4 Skyhawks and Hawker Hunters and new F-16s will be arriving in 1987 to add to Singapore's striking power.
quick air response is the key to defense here. If there is even a threat from neighboring countries, which are only minutes away. Singapore likes to think of itself as the Switzerland of the East, peaceful and quietly going about its business. But just as in Switzerland, every able-bodied man must serve in the military and be ready to fight for most of his life. Singapore claims it could quickly turn out an armed force of a quarter of a million men, 50,000 on active duty, and another 200,000 who can be mobilized almost on a moment's notice. Every new recruit will spend two years on active duty, two and a half years if he becomes an officer. And then he'll be in the reserves, doing a month of active duty every year until he is 40 and until he's 50 years old if he is an officer. It's much like Israel, which provided military advisors when Singapore was setting up its military system. The Navy has small cutters patrolling the Straits of Malacca, not so much to fight a major invasion, but to protect Singapore's commerce. Secure commerce means prosperity here, this is the second busiest seaport in the world. Only Amsterdam is busier. And ships that anchor here want to know they will be safe from pirates. The cutters patrol against speedboat marauders, who occasionally slip in from nearby Indonesian islands, off on the horizon, and try to raid the freighters. Even civilian trucks and other heavy construction equipment are registered for national defense and can be commandeered by the military for any emergency in case of an attack or even in some civil disaster. Singaporeans call that part of total defense. And even the new metropolitan rapid transit system being built to serve all of Singapore has a second defense purpose. Underground stations like this one will also be available as emergency air raid shelters. So defense is always in the minds of Singaporeans and the government keeps it there with constant reminders of every citizen's responsibility if there is ever a crisis. Some insight into what defense means to Singapore came from a long-term observer of this government. He's Michael Richardson, the regional editor of the International Herald Tribune. In Singapore, you see this slogan, total defense. You know, we, see it, we, we see it on buses and we see it on even a, a carton of bean milk. Tell us a little bit about this concept. The government wants to get ordinary citizens actively involved in uh, the defense of Singapore, to give them a feeling that they have a, a big stake in preserving this country and, and what has been achieved. Um, I think you can only understand this, uh, this uh, sensitivity about security, this feeling that Singapore and what's been created here is essentially fragile if you look back a bit and, and see the very inauspicious beginnings of Singapore. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, no one, almost no one thought in the late 50s, early 60s, that Singapore would hang together and develop as a very successful, prosperous state. Mm -hmm. It has, but the people who run it, the old, particularly those like Lee Kuan Yew, are very conscious of its beginning. 
and they are also very conscious of the international environment, um, some of which they see as being hostile to Singapore, and that is why they've got uh, very modern uh, defense forces that can pack a punch that's really out of all proportion to the size of Singapore, mm -hmm. and that is why they have had a national service uh, system which is compulsory, uh, and that is why they're trying to develop this system of total defense, but it's also to give, to, to sustain this climate of confidence that really it's intangible, and yet it's such an important part of Singapore's success. Foreign investors, businessmen, hard-nosed, wouldn't come here unless they felt secure about Singapore's future, and that's really what the tanks and the planes and the guns and the total defense is all about. Military spokesman told us that Singapore sees no immediate threats and has no enemy neighbors. But, he said, Singapore must be like a porcupine. It is not an aggressor, but its needles are very sharp if you care to take a whack at him. Well, that's our show for tonight. See you next week. I'm Yusai Khan for Looking East. Air transportation to Singapore provided by Air Canada. To China by CAAC. To Malaysia by the Malaysian Airlines System. And to Thailand by Thai Airways International. Hotel accommodations provided by the Regent of Bangkok and the Singapore Hyatt.